Здравствуйте, уважаемые друзья. Сегодня мы в гостях в посольстве Великобритании в Ашхабаде. Берем интервью у госпожи посла мисс Торда Эбетот. Здравствуйте. Здравствуйте. Yes, now we'll go on in English. Um, uh, Miss Ambassador, please tell us a little about yourself, about your work in Turkmenistan. Well, um, obviously I'm enjoying being here enormously. The range of the embassy's work is, although we're a very small embassy, we cover quite a lot of issues. We cover regional affairs and clearly Turkmenistan's role in the region. Um, their relationship with other countries in the region. Uh, we cover, we have a human rights dialogue with the Turkmen authorities and we promote British trade and British interests here. We also run a, a series of projects and we have a number of scholarships, the evening scholarship scheme, which is um, actually just opening within the next couple of days for um, Turkmen students to go to the United Kingdom to take postgraduate education. Uh, do you mean this first year? Yes, it's a new yeah. program. No, it, this is we have it, it happens annually, but this we 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 have a rolling program, and it's just about to open for this year. Mm -hmm. We have a we have a body of Chevening alumni who we keep in touch with here. Great. What languages do you speak? I Only English. Well. <laughs> I know that you understand Russian a little. Не много. Я изучаю русский язык, но я не говорю очень хорошо. We know that your father uh, was also a diplomat, and uh, when you firstly started your diplomatic career, you, you started your work in FCO. You were only 19 years old. It was 1974. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you please tell us, uh, was it your personal decision to start uh, working in uh, FCO or uh, your father wanted to, you to follow in his footsteps? My father just wanted me to be happy in life. He was very pleased when I chose the Foreign Office. He thought it would be an interesting career for me. Um, but no, he didn't attempt to, to influence me directly. Obviously, having travelled with him, that in itself was, was, was an influence. We were in Afghanistan when I was in my teens and I looked round and I thought, what an interesting country. How do I get somebody to pay me to come back to this part of, part of the world? Uh, it took a little time, but here I am. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, what were your first steps in your diplomatic career? My first job was in our protocol department. Um, I looked after the inward visits of heads of state and heads of government, which sounds very important, but there was an awful lot of time checking guest lists and uh, seeing people were in the right place at the right time. I, I then went on to um, a political job, as we would call it, a geographical desk. I looked after um, Zimbabwe at the time when it was still Rhodesia and then I went off to South America and did a series of jobs filling in for people. So, an interesting start. Mm. Yes. Uh, so, uh, about your career, uh, what is your career in the list of your life values? In what sense? I mean, uh, you have uh, family, you have friends, I don't know, career. Family comes first. And the career? Is... And the career. The career has run in parallel. I have very few immediate family. My parents died when I was quite young, but um, I have uh, a partner of 24 years standing. And yes, even though he would say, he would probably say something different, I would always put him at the top. Mm -hmm. So the next question is exactly about Mr. Reef Talbot Hark. Yes? Uh, uh, how uh, how does he refer to your very busy uh, diplomatic career? I think he enjoys it. Um, I mean, he would have to have enjoyed it or we wouldn't have been together so long. I never take a posting overseas without talking it through with him because it is a joint 
issue for, for, for both of us. He loves coming out here. He finds Turkmenistan incredibly interesting. He finds the hot weather a bit too much in summer, so he goes back to the, to the UK. But uh, no, I, I think he rather likes it because for the last 24 years it has been a counterpoint to his own work. He's a lawyer in London until he retired a couple of years ago. Um, he did some travel as a result of this, but coming out and joining and supporting me is a complete, was a complete contrast to the work that he did himself. And in the same way I sometimes played the company wife and uh, we, 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 we sort of changed, changed roles, in each case with a different one of us being the, the supporting partner. Uh, we know uh, very few uh, successful women diplomats, uh, politicians, and can you please tell us what are the pros and cons uh, of a diplomatic career for a woman? Oh, I think there are enormous advantages. Uh, I think that quite often a woman can say things and can speak very much more frankly than a man would get away with. Uh, at least I've, 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 I've found this. I've found it possible to be much more upfront and much more open sometimes than my, than, than my male colleagues. The downsides early on in my career were the obvious ones of being very much in a minority and the tendency of people to assume that you were the secretary, which is great. Um, I don't actually have secretarial skills, but I can certainly remember walking into a meeting of senior men and them looking around as if to say, well, what are you doing here? So you have to have enormous self-confidence. Um, most of your colleagues here, uh, either do I, uh, like your openness. You are so open and happy woman. Um, can you please uh, tell me if um, this openness is a trait of your personal character or it's rather a professional image of a diplomat? I think I actually, I marry the two together. I think it is something that I am by nature. I think if in your professional life you act out of character, I think it shows. So, uh, yes, I am open and I'm generally cheerful and, and happy. There are times when um, sad things happen and that is not appropriate. I am, when the occasion demands it, I am very serious indeed. I'm very serious about the job. But I don't think that that means that one, one can't enjoy a little light-heartedness as well. Can you please uh, describe your greatest achievement? In your diplomatic career, I mean whole career, and, uh, and the most impressive failure, if any. <laughs> Gosh, do I really want to talk about my failures? Um, I can't think of anything that I failed in massively. My biggest achievement is to be a head of mission five times. That's that that was that was good. That was good. That was, in some respects, I mean, I'm very lucky. My own diplomatic service is full of very, very nice people. And they have always been generous and given me a hand up and helped me develop. Um, we're not saints. Maybe there are one or two people I wouldn't necessarily want to meet again, but very, very few. So I think it's thanks to all the support I've had that I've been able to have these amazing jobs. What are the secrets of a successful uh, diplomat career? Uh, what, what qualities a good diplomat uh, should have? Stamina and determination. You need energy and you need to have a quality that when you look at obstacles, you don't stop and say, oh, it's all too difficult. You try and work out how you might get around them. And you try and work out sometimes which battles are not worth fighting. You know, let it go, don't waste your energy on it. Deal with the things that you can actually make, make happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we can say, uh, solve the problem or die trying. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try not to die. No other way. <laughs> No, yeah, I think sometimes, sometimes you have to let a problem go. Sometimes you're not going to solve it. Um, maybe somebody else will come along later and solve it. Maybe you have laid the groundwork, but you have to know when to, when to give up and do something more important that you might succeed at. Mm -hmm. uh, have you had to transcend your professional activities through your 
personal principles ever? Well, we have we have the possibility in our service if there is my, my job is to do what my ministers want and we have a vibrant democracy in the United Kingdom we change governments completely at fairly regular yes. intervals or turn generally alternatively Labour and Conservative but in the last coalition the last government we had a coalition with the Liberal Democrats and each one of those governments will bring in different policies generally in the Foreign Office the national interest is the national interest but there are differences of uh, dif differences of, of emphasis um, and the job of a civil servant is to be flexible enough to say these are the people who've been elected these are the people I'm here to serve. What they want to do, it's my job to achieve. And I don't have a problem with that. I think if you have a problem with that, then you shouldn't be in our civil service because we are, we are neutral and independent of ministers. We will offer our best advice, but we will also do what we're in, instructed to do. And I have never yet, I, 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 I'm not going to tell you which ones. There have been policies that I have thought I'm not certain that that's what I would do, but I have never yet actually been asked to do something that I feel so strongly about that I have said I can't do that. I have a question about it. I'll ask it later. Um, in the early 2000s, you worked uh, for a couple of years in Dushanbe, uh, also in Afghanistan, in Armenia, and now you are working here in Turkmenistan. Uh, can you please uh, tell us what are the interests of UK in this region? Well, of course, we've got a long history in this part of the world, as, as you know. Um, we have very genuinely a concern that it should remain peaceful and stable, because what happens here affects Western Europe as well. And I think that's at the root of our, of, of, of our interest. Obviously, we look for British trading interests as well um, and to promote our, our values. But ultimately, we look for the prosperity and stability of the region because we have um, a foreign policy that is, that is led, if you like, by those principles, but also very pragmatically because if this region comes in, falls into difficulties, then those do impact on Europe as well. Uh, in which areas uh, are Turkmenistan and UK are currently cooperating? Uh, any British companies uh, ha having yes. projects here? We have a number of companies that sell into, into Turkmenistan, in, including JCB, for example, for, for earth moving equipment. And a number of companies' products end up here but they don't necessarily export directly. A lot of things come by way of Turkey or Dubai um, and are brought in by, 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 Turkmen, by Turkmen businesses. And we have an ongoing dialogue on a number of subjects, including regional issues. Uh, what do you like uh, most about Turkmenistan? You are for two years, yes, you are here. Gosh, what do I like most? <laughs> Um, I think that I like the Turkmen people. I like their hospitality and their kindness. Very occasionally they are nervous about engaging with foreigners um, because in some respects they've been brought up to think that we're somehow subversive. But I've, I've never found that's actually been a problem in a face-to-face -face, face -face contact. It's an amazingly hospitable country and I'll, I'll give you an example. I went up to Dervaza with, with Reef a few months ago and um, the other thing of course I like enormously is I love camels very very fond of camels going up to Dervaza I saw a baby camel definitely I wanted to see the baby camel so we jump out of the car and I go and I take several hundred photographs of the baby camel okay slight exaggeration but it really was the most beautiful baby camel you've ever seen and an elderly lady and gentleman came out of their yurt and never having seen us before um, I sort of gestured and said, you know, is it your camel? And they said, yes. And they insisted on having us in and giving us tea, which in the yurt, which was just an incredibly generous thing to do. That wouldn't happen in London. 
if you saw a stranger admiring your horse, you wouldn't necessarily invite them in for tea. So uh, very, very touching and moments like that are very, very moving. So you must have tested camel's milk. Didn't like it. I really don't get on with camel's milk, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think it's lovely for baby camels. Yes. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not really for me. We do have a member of our team who has some camels and I have warned him that, you know, I'm sure the camel milk is lovely, but please, you know, not it's for me. It's quite popular here. It's very place. popular. Yes. It's very popular. Uh, please describe three of your diplomatic achievements here in Turkmenistan in these two years? Well, um, I think we may have identified a site for a new embassy. We would like to, 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 to move in, in due course. Um, I have established what I think is a very good working relationship with both the Minister and the Deputy Foreign Ministers um, um, for Foreign Affairs. And uh, well, that probably counts as three because there are at least three deputies and and and, the, and, and a foreign minister. What else have I achieved? Um, we had a very successful Turkmenistan-UK Trade and Investment Council in January, where um, the Finance and Economy Minister came over to the UK and Mr. Hadjiev from the from the Foreign Ministry and we're able to meet a number of, of, of British ministers, which is incredibly useful because we don't see many Turkmen in London. And for them to put their perspective on trade, and again, we had a, a, a political discussion, was, uh, it was it was an achievement. It wasn't all mine. Um, the department in London did a lot of the work as well. But yes, I, I, I was the driving force behind it. So I, I was very pleased that it was a success. Last year, you were awarded the Royal OBE Award. It's uh, Officer of the Order of the British Empire Award. For what particular achievements have you been nominated for this award? Well, you're never told. Nobody ever actually tells us what we, we got it for. We're not allowed to see the, the ah. citation. Um, but at it was, in theory, it was awarded for um, foreign policy. And I think it was in recognition of particularly the last 10 to 15 years of my work in, in, in the office. Very and a way of saying thank you, which was, which was very nice. It was a big surprise. The head of the diplomatic service put through a telephone call and uh, oh, his secretary asked me if I'd, I'd talk to him. And of course, my first thought was, oh dear, what have I done? Um, and then he asked me if I would accept it, and I said yes, and then I was formally, formally given it. And uh, I went earlier this year to collect it from Prince Charles, which was wow. great fun. So uh, is it uh, the greatest award a diplomat can achieve? or No, it's about a middle ranking, <laughs> but I'm very happy. It's senior enough. Uh -huh. uh, please name three major achievements of uh, UK or British Empire also in whole history that it exists? I think the spreading of democratic values. Um, I think the graceful withdrawal from our empire. A lot of empires have broken up in a very bloody fashion. And we, during the 1960s, accepted entirely countries' wishes to be independent and stepped back, as we did for Hong Kong, I think, was probably the, 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 the latest one. Ah, uh, what else have we achieved? Oh, there have been a new, I, I, I think possibly the invention of the internet, Berners Webb. Mm. Uh, what about this uh, British famous um both, I mean, oh, the Armada, yes. Well, I don't want to irritate my Spanish like colleagues. <laughs> um, yes, there was Napoleon as well. We saw him off at Waterloo. We've, yes, the, and, you know, obviously there have been a significant number of, of, of yeah, British inventions, really. but the internet has been, in the 20th century, has probably been the greatest one, the one with the greatest impact and influence. Mm -hmm. What are the names of the, th again, three most prominent British politicians in history. All of history. What have they done? Right I would say Elizabeth I. Uh, she was both a queen and a politician. Um, 
and I would include obviously Churchill because he came to the fore at a time when we very much needed somebody of his, his stature in, in the last generation. And I would have to name Margaret Thatcher because she was the first woman Prime Minister and uh, we, needed, we needed a woman at the top. So there you are, you've got two women, women and one man. A few comments about Brexit. Um, pros and cons for European Union, for uh, UK, so... I'm sure they'll miss us when we've gone. Um, what can I say? No, seriously, this is something that the British people wanted. And it is difficult. We've spent many decades within the UK and unhitching ourselves from the organisation is, is clearly a complex procedure. Uh, but with goodwill on both sides, we're, we're, we will make it. We will make it work. We, we obviously we have to. We have to come out with a solution on issues like trade that does not disadvantage the United Kingdom. But we also want to maintain a strong relationship with our European colleagues. We're, we're simply leaving the organisation, we're not leaving Europe. And we will again, as with the Americans, we will continue to have common values, common interests. What we're looking for and what we're working on is a smooth transition from here to, 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 to there. And the current plan is that although we will formally cease to be members of the European Union on, in March next year, uh, we will continue for two years to be bound by our EU obligations and have the EU rights in order to make this sort of smooth transition work. Um, we will be um, entering into a new bilateral agreement with Turkmenistan uh, because the, at, the, at the moment the framework through which we conduct a lot of our bilateral relationship is, a pro, is, a, is an interim partnership and cooperation agreement between the EU and Turkmenistan. We will no longer be part of the EU element of that, so we're going to try to replicate that, um, basically taking the same provisions, except obviously those that relate to European architecture, um, and replicate that in a, bilateral, in a bilateral treaty. So my life is not boring and I've got lots to do. Okay, the main part of our interview is over. Marcel Proust questionnaire. We have uh, short questions. Yes. If you don't like them, of course you can say that. Uh, I will not answer. Um, what do you most appreciate in people? Integrity. Which is a bit more than honesty. It goes a bit more deep, deeply than honesty. But somebody who deals with you honestly, frankly, finds a way to say what they need to say, even if it's difficult. And kindness. If not in UK, in which country would you like to live? Mm. Golly, there are so many. I've always been tempted by Italy because of the food and the sunshine. We have both here in Turkmenistan. You have a bit <laughs> too much sunshine <laughs> at the moment. No, I, I, if, I, if I were a millionaire and had a chance to live anywhere, I'm actually a city person. And um, I think basically the two greatest cities are probably um, London and New York. So I would, I would possibly spend some time in, in New York. But there's a lot of the former Soviet space that I haven't, I haven't seen. I still, want to, um, I still want to do the Trans-Siberian Express. Reef and I have plans one day. Your favorite flowers? Oh, freesia. Do you believe in God? Yes. Uh, what is the most vivid manifestation of the Lord and the devil on the earth right now in this world? Gosh, now that's difficult. Um, I don't really know. Um, I think you, what you, you're getting into the philosophy of sort of goodness and evil, and there are so many examples of both. You can I ask, mean, uh, answer shortly. The people, in terms of goodness, the people who look after other people with no particular reward, 
Um, you have a lot of people who look after people in their families and sometimes people who look after people outside their families. All the charitable work that goes on is an enormous manifestation of, of, of good throughout the world. Look at people like Médecins Sans Frontières. In terms of evil, well, obviously wars are the clearest manifestation of, of evil. The most pronounced trait of your character? Stubbornness. If you could do this, what would you like to change in your past? Gosh. I can't think of many things I would have changed because everything that you do leads me to where I am now. And, you know, that's quite a, quite a good place. Um, your favorite activity in your free time? Oh, gosh, I have lots of things I, I, I like doing. Um, in the UK, I ride horses. Um, I like horses. They're not in the least bit impressed that I'm an ambassador. What you know. about Turkmen horses? Turkmen horses, I'm too afraid to ride. They're too, too jumpy. They're, they're beautiful, um, but they're very excitable, very highly strung, and I'm worried that I would come off too quickly. <laughs> what is your main disadvantage? Gosh. Got it. How many? Um, what is my main disadvantage? I think sometimes I don't always give people enough silence and enough space to say what they want to say. I tend to know what I think and to sail ahead, which is brilliant. You know, everybody likes to know where the leader's going and you know what she sees over the mountain. But sometimes I need to make space for people. What are the three main ingredients of women's happiness? Are they any different from those of a man's happiness? I think you need to be, I think you, the, the greatest happiness is to be part of a family, even if it's only a small family. Um, beyond that, uh, the good fortune to be able to follow a career and to do something that you, that you actually love doing. Are you a happy woman? Yes. Uh, what do By you... and large, don't get me on a bad day. <laughs> what do you consider to be the greatest misfortune? What is the greatest misfortune? I think the greatest misfortune is to have an unfriendly character because that then impacts on how people treat you. Okay. Uh, if it was possible, with whom, whoever lived in this planet, would you like to meet and talk? Mm. Gosh, how far back would one go? Throughout history, they don't have to be alive? Yes. Oh, well, I suppose it would have to be Christ. I was thinking about that. After it all that you believe in God, uh, what are you disgusted with? Oh Lord, meanness, unkindness. What do you regret most about? I don't have many regrets. Um, I mean, there are other things that I could have done with with my life, but. I don't sit there, there's nothing, there's nothing major that I, I regret. I sometimes have small regrets about times when I've perhaps myself treated somebody unkindly, possibly not meaning to, possibly just merely angry, but, you know, I would rather not do that. Your favourite aphorism? See. Mm. <laughs> Usually onward and upward. Uh, what events in the history of humanity do you value most? Oh, the discovery of fire. Because I'm quite greedy and we couldn't cook without fire. And the internet. <laughs> the internet. <laughs> I don't spend a lot of time on the internet, actually. I do think it's an enormously useful, useful invention. But uh, what else would, would, would one value? Oh, the, 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 the sort of uh, friendship. Okay, and the last question. 
If you had the opportunity to give yourself, a 20-year-old girl, uh, only one message, what would you say to her? Don't worry, it's going to be fine. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Это была посол Великобритании. Спасибо.